normally in our Bible Fest, we we start off our first day with a plenary talk. We had a wonderful plenary by Sarah Parkak yesterday about the latest in Egyptian archaeology. And we always wonder, especially in a virtual format, kind of what works well for sort of a second sort of showcase performance, just another lecture, another sort of panelists. And we thought this time for our Spring Fest, we thought it'd be interesting to try out the notion of a, a performance of some kind. You know, looking on your computers tend, tends to be a rather passive activity. How can we make it something a little more engaging, a little more dynamic? And so it occurred to us that a musical performance uh, might be a very interesting way to engage our viewers in uh, a different type of biblical scholarship, a different type of archaeology. And so it's really a pleasure to have with us today um, uh, Michael Levy, uh, who is a UK-based composer whose musical mission is to continue where the ancients left off in creating new music for the recreated ancient lyre. Michael's music has been incorporated into Rufus Wainwright's opera Hadrian, the soundscape for Jeff Kuhn's sculpture Apollo Cathara, and his music has been featured as part of the permanent soundscape to the Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C. And he'll be doing, again, sort of not necessarily a lecture today, but sort of a performance with explanation on the sound and music of the biblical lyre, an evocation of the music of the ancient biblical temple lyres of the Levites and the lyre of King David, performed on modern recreations of the ten-string biblical canor and an actual replica of a Canaanite style liar discovered in Egypt. So it's really a pleasure to welcome you, Michael. Before you begin, I did want to point out that Michael's been uh, very kind to share a number of resources with our participants. So um, you'll notice that there is in your Zoom screen, in the panel at the bottom of your Zoom screen, there's now a resources button. And if you click on that resources button, if you click under not the links tab, but the documents tab, you'll see a series of PDFs, about three or four PDFs that Michael's made available. These are largely uh, PDFs of images of ancient lyres and musical instruments that Michael will be referring to. Um, but uh, those are some excellent resources that you can download and view during the course of his performance. We'll also be showing those at various points during his presentation and performance. So with that, Michael, I think I'll turn the, the Zoom Floor the the Zoom uh, concert hall over to you. So thank you for joining us for our, our first uh, Bass Bible Fest performance. We look forward to it. The pleasure is mine. Um, right. Um, a pleasure to um finally perform before you. Um, what I'm going to start with, in short, in a nutshell, I'm going to discuss um what we can infer from the, the rather sparse archaeological record about the biblical lyres, um, starting off with, well, first of all, what did King David's lyre look like, let alone sound like? Um, the nearest we've got to King David's lyre is the Megiddo ivory. And this um, is basically a piece of ivory found in Megiddo. And inscribed on it is a picture of a Canaanite style lyre, which dates to about 300 years before the traditional biblical time of King David. Um, and this particular type of lyre found its way into Egypt, presumably when the um, Hyksos kings were ruling Egypt, who obviously were Canaanites and they ruled Egypt for 100 years. That's how the lyre probably ended up in Egypt. But anyway, this lyre I'm playing is a replica of the Leiden lyre. This is a Canaanite style lyre from about the time of King David, a bit before, a few centuries before, that was found in Le found um, in Thebes um, about 1830 and it was recreated by Lutherios in Greece. So to start the sound stage I'm going to do a tune, not one of my tunes, but actually one of the oldest tunes in musical history from about 1500 BC when this lyre was first created. That's the Hurrian hymn to Nikal, the oldest notated melody in history and this is what it sounds like and it sounds actually quite biblical. <laughs>
So as far as gold noldies go, that's the oldest gold noldie. So that dates to, um, as I say, from around um, about the 14th century BCE. So moving in time to King David. Now, assuming that um, David made his own lyre, it would have been maybe a little bit more rustic looking than this. Um, and since these lyres were common throughout Canaan, again, that's another reason why he might have played it. And just as a very quick, quick aside, like the work of Israel Phil, um, Finkelstein, who um, interestingly thinks that um, the Hebrews may well have been a lower class of Canaanites, who then developed their own identity during the Bronze Age collapse. Very likely, this the lyre of King David might have actually been a literal Canaanite lyre. Um, but like, like the ex examples between um, Israeli pottery and Canaanite pottery, the difference being the Israelite pottery was just a little bit le more rustic looking. This, um, yes, probably the same with King David's lyre. It might have been less refined than this, but probably sounded and looked pretty much the same. So moving forward in time, to um, the temple. Then we come across the work of Susan Haik van Chora, um, a very little known French composer, but her life's mission was to um, basically um, rediscover the music of the Levites, the music sang during the ancient temple services. And she focused on the Te Amim accents found in the Masoretic text the oldest text surviving of the Hebrew Bible. And she had this inclination, this hunch that they had some forgotten musical meaning. And it was forgotten, of course, when the Romans destroyed the temple uh, in 70 CE. But um, the music she revealed, um, I'm not going to go into the intricacies of it, but there's whole sections of it on my website in the historical research section. But the music she revealed is amazing. And I think the music speaks for itself. This is the, this is Susan Haik Van Chora's reconstruction of the priestly blessing um, that was sung every day in the Temple of Jerusalem. Very haunting tune. So maybe as near as we can get to the actual um, sound of King David's lyre. Um, so moving forward in time to um, maybe the Second Temple era, and um, and we find um, another example, about the only other iconic. Let's just put this lyre down a second. Moving forward in time, we find um, the Bar Kokhba coins. This is from about 135 CE, from this time of the Simon Bar Kokhba revolt against the revolting Romans for destroying the Jewish temple um, about 65 years earlier. And these are the oldest examples of what the biblical line might have looked like in the Greco-Roman times. I don't know if you can see this clearly. Um, I'll just uh, put that. This is actually my c CD I did, that, which inspired me to play the lyre. And this is called King David's Lyre, Echoes of Ancient Israel. Um, it's actually on, on all the digital music platforms, though we don't sell the CDs anymore. But it's right in the middle there, and I think Michelle's got an image of that, if you can see that. That's a Simon Bar Kochba coin with this elongated lyre on the front of it. And um, I was lucky enough to find a modern replica on this thing. And on King David's lyre, Echoes of Ancient Israel, that was um, the first CD I did back in 2008, I had the idea of um, arranging traditional Jewish melodies for this amazing looking instrument. And the fascinating thing I found is that the Jewish, the traditional Jewish scales um, used in 
the sacred music and an instrumental klezmer fit the ten strings of this lyre absolutely perfectly. In fact, so perfectly that one particular klezmer mode implies another one. I'll show you what's briefly what I mean and then I'll play some musical examples. So this is what you call the Aharaba mode, which is the most common Jewish mode and it's also very common throughout the ancient Near East as well. And when you tune to the Aharaba mode on the second string, on the first string automatically you will have another of the most common Jewish musical modes, the um, Mishcherabach, I think you pronounce it. So I'm going to start off um, just with some instrumental music that I've arranged for this amazing instrument. Um, I'll actually start off with something that showcases both these modes. Um, I think it's called a Dessa Bulgar. It's um, a traditional klezmer melody, but it's like this is a, the idea of King David's lyre. It's like a musical collage. I take traditional Jewish music and I transform the original musical meaning of it by the timbre of this wonderful instrument to give it a completely new meaning. Here we go. <laughs> Um, an improvisation a little bit around the melody and incorporating those two amazing um, modes heard throughout the whole klezmer and sacred Jewish repertoire. And the modes fit the instrument so perfectly I'm almost certain, well a hunch, that they might have had their origin on the actual ten strings of the original biblical lyre itself. Who knows? Um, so let's move on and um, play some more of these amazing tunes. Um, Let's just find the tunes that we were referring to. So we're going to play this. That was a, a tune from the, the Klezmer repertoire, the instrumental Jewish repertoire. This is a very common tune in the um, sacred repertoire. It's actually composed by Israel Gold, Goldfarb in 1918. But it sounds like it was like 1918 BC. It's a timeless melody and it's the tune to Shalom Aleichem, which in the Hebrew service in the um, means and um, peace be upon you. Thank you. 
So, as I explained, it's a timeless melody, um, and the notes fit the instrument almost as if the instrument invented the scale itself. Incredible. So that was um, Shalom and Lycan. Um, I'm going to, uh, that was, I demonstrated on the, this particular instrument, um, two scales, two particular modes. Um, just as I mentioned before, um, the instrument on the Bar Kokhba coins, um, if you have a look at the PDF or the image of, um, in, in the PDF, that you'll see that there's a ridge down the centre of the Bar Kokhba coins. Now this ties into my idea of um, the ancient Greek Kithara actually being the basis of this instrument, ironically, because if you think of it, um, the temple was destroyed in um, 70 CE. The Bar Kokhba revolt against the Romans was in 135 CE. That's like 65 years later. That's out of living memory. And the ironic thing, the Jewish rebels who were fighting against the Romans, the only lies they would have seen would have been Greco-Roman ones. So the actual ins the actual lies they were stamping onto the coins over um, that the 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 Roman currency in their rebellion, ironically, was probably a Greco-Roman liar. And say so the reason I think this as well, besides the, the similarity between the Bar Kokhba coin and the the Greek silver stator coin, this ridge is actually pagan iconography, and I can demonstrate this on a tortoiseshell lyre. That's um, I'm not going to play this today, but the the ridge probably represented the spine down the shell of a tortoise in reference to the god Hermes, who was, according to the classical mythology, was the first god to create the lyre out of the shell of a tortoiseshell. So that's the ironic thing. The um, Bar, Bar Kokhba rebels wanted to uh, rebuild the temple and had these temple instruments. The actual instruments they were depicting actually probably had, sadly and ironically, pagan imagery on the back of them because they looked like classical the classical Kithara. So that's just another bit of background. And I'm going to play um, another lyre. This is another ten string lyre. It's a modern evocation again of the very elusive biblical kinor. And again it looks a little bit like a Greco-Roman lyre itself. And this is made in America actually by a um, marine made harp. It's got a very nice harp-like timbre to it. So I'm going to do um, something quite relaxing. Let's we'll do um, We'll do Hatikva, which is the obviously the Israeli national anthem, and it sounds rather nice on these ten strings. And um, that also demonstrates another of the most common um, musical modes used through, not just through Israel and probably ancient Israel, but throughout the Near East. This is like the natural minor, the natural minor mode, um, which a lot of uh, this music is based on. That was Shalom. Um, that was, um, sorry, that was Hatikva. Yes, Hatikva. Um, while I'm still on the same instrument, again we'll um, do something quite uh, mellow, let me think. We'll do um, Haini Matov, or How Beautiful, that's a traditional Israeli tune.
Um, so, yeah, we don't know exactly what the Tamra, as I say, of the biblical liar was about. Um, what it might have sounded like, but we do have a few clues from the Mishnah, actually, um, which tells us that um, in the Levitical Ensemble, um, the, the biblical kinor, um, an instrument which had ten strings, um, had the sh had strings made from the the guts of the upper port upper portion of the intestines of sheep, which were thinner strings, and the nevel that was a twelve string biblical lyre, had um, the thicker um, strings made from the lower portion of the sheep's intestines. So that implies that the kinor was more a treble register instrument, and um, the nevel with 12 strings was probably in the bass register. And that also um, applies to um, a writing by Flavius Josephus, who actually witnessed the Levites play the temp in the temple during the first century, um, who describes, um, I think it was Josephus anyway, but it, it mentions, there's a mention that there are 12 kinors and more may be added, whereas there's only about two um, Nevels in the Levitical Ensemble. So like a modern string orchestra, proportionally there's more treble instruments than bass. So that's two threads that we can imply that the Biblical Kinor may well have been a treble register instrument. So that's just a bit of an aside about the background, because this is obviously a much more treble sounding instrument than the one I was just playing. Um, okay, so now we're going to have a bit more of a uh, Middle Eastern flavour to the next tune. Let's just Begin over here. <clears throat> okay. So this particular tune, it's, it's my own tune, but it's based around um, a Babylonian Jewish wedding song. And the thing is with Jewish music, the traditions can go back literally thousands of years. So this particular, the essence of this tune could have been before the first... Um, um, before before the conquest of Babylon, when we're talking about 700 BC, so who knows? This could be part of it. But anyway, this is what the tune sounds like with my improvisations things around it. Um, yeah, a bit of a improvisation, if you like, on an ancient Jewish Babylonian wedding song, which could have its roots around 
the, the time of Solomon's Temple itself, just before it got destroyed by the Babylonians. Amazing stuff. Um, so we'll go back um, to a more gentle sound now on my other treble um, ten string modern evocation of a biblical kino. Uh, this little beauty over here. And we shall do, what shall we do? Uh, do, do, do. Um, oh yeah, we'll do um, Jerusalem of Gold, another very nice traditional Jewish folk song. A lovely song um it was actually i think written by naomi shamer but it's got that lovely timeless quality because it uses this very ancient natural minor scale very common throughout the, the near east and again which fits the perfect fits perfectly the ten strings of the recreated biblical wires um let's go back to um my rather greco-roman looking rendition of the biblical kino and um Again, I'll do a slightly more up-tempo tune this time. Um, again, um, from a, the Klezmer repertoire. <clears throat> okay.
So, um, an amazing um, klezmer melody, which again, um, like a musical collage, taking it from its traditional context and playing it with this wonderful ancient lyre timbre, demonstrating some of those interesting lyre techniques as well. Um, it completely transforms the musical meaning of the tune. Um, and by the way, in the question time at the end, do ask me about ancient lyre playing techniques because I'd like to share some of the tricks of the tree that I've been picking up and where I've sort of developed these from the historical sources, in fact. Um, yeah, so let's uh, go back in time again and we shall try... What else could we do? Oh yeah, a slightly slower tune from the Jewish Klezmer repertoire. Um, yeah, just one more tune, um, and I think that will take us to the end of this musical adventure in time travel. Again, a more upbeat tune this time, um, taken from the Klezmer repertoire. I think it's called Bukavina Freilex or something, but it sounds very upbeat and wonderfully mystical on this lyre.
Thank you very much, Michael. That was really a pleasure to listen to. And thank you very much for the performances and the explanations of all the instruments. Um, it was really a wonderful way to start off our second day of our Spring Fest. So I realized that was a, a lot of going back and forth with the instruments and playing the different songs. So we really appreciate your help with that. But at this time, I'd definitely like to invite the audience. If you have questions about the instruments or anything that Michael performed, uh, please do put those questions in the Q&A button in uh, Zoom. And we'll try to get to as many of those as possible in the time. Fortunately, we have a fair amount of time for questions. Uh, we only have a couple of questions in the Q&A. Um, I'll take two together. Uh, you mentioned this, uh, I think, a little bit in your description, Michael, but can you describe a little bit about the composition of the instruments, just materials-wise, especially related to the strings as also uh, I guess maybe the wood or the different materials used in the actual construction of the lyres? Uh, certainly, yeah. Um, the most authentic instrument, um, which was custom designed, was obviously the this one, the Leiden lyre, which I wanted something as near as possible as to what King David might have played. So um, <clears throat> this is probably the most interesting construction because it's a, basically the form of a Canaanite lyre, which, which, which was, would have been the instrument King David would have been familiar with his day-to-day -day life and um the the soundboard is cedar and um which is a, a nice uh softer type of wood throughout the near east i'm not entirely sure what the, the hardwood is made of on this particular model because i don't make the instruments myself but the interesting thing as well with this instrument i've got a flat bridge on it it has quite a buzzy timbre to it The reason for this, um, if you listen to the traditional lyre still played today throughout Africa, it always has this buzzy timbre to it. And what fascinates me as well, um, that the Hebrew word for melody or song, zemmer, sounds onomatopoeic. It's got a buzzing sound to it. So very lightly, it's just a hunch of course, maybe the original biblical lyre, the lyres of David, had this buzz to it. And indeed, look at the Ethiopian Begina. That's a bass lyre, still played in Ethiopia with the tradition that it was King Menelik I, none other than the king, the son of Solomon, King Solomon of Israel, and his marriage to the wife of the Egyptian Queen of Sheba, that brought this instrument to Ethiopia. And of course, Ethiopia also has, also has the, tradition, the tradition of having the Ark of the Covenant still in um, the Temple of Aksum. So there's lots of other circumstantial evidence to back this up. So... That's to do with this buzzing tarmer, which I was really interested in creating on this little instrument. So, yeah, so bridge construction, construction of it. Also, the sound holes, you'll notice, are actually in the bass because this was traditionally played horizontally and usually standing up. And if you're standing, standing up horizontally, the sound's going to project from the back. Whereas um, the Greco Roman lyres was playing, they usually played vertically. Uh, can you mention just a bit about the strings and what, um, what oh, yes. On this either, either the replicas or, or in antiquity, what the, the strings would have been made of? Yeah, usually it was um, any sort of natural fibre that was around. Um, usually sheep gut is a very good material to make the strings out of. And it was usually unpolished gut. That's the difference between modern harp strings that we have today. They're polished, so that's a more uniform sound. Whereas it's much more quirky if you have unpolished gut. This actually has unpolished gut on it. So it's each each note has its own particular tone, but it sounds very, very subtly different to the ear. It's hard to tell through a little microphone, but... Each note has a very slightly different individual unique tone to it compared to um, something like nylon. And another good question, and this is, I mean, for anybody who does ancient music, I imagine this is a question that they get all the time, but how do we know what sort of ancient songs, tunes, melodies were played 3,000, 2,000 years ago? I mean, we have some sense of the instruments, but what what sources of data, what sources of information do we have for the, the tunes, the melodies, the arrangements, I guess? Now, um, twofold, really. First of all, from the archaeological point of view, there's actual melodies which survive, particularly from ancient Greece. Um, there's about 60 notated melodies from ancient Greece that, that survive, um, going back as early as 400 BC, right up to um, the oldest complete notated melody, the Song of Sikolos, which we're lucky to have all the notes for. And that used like an alphabetical symbol of notation, similar to our A, B, C, D, E, F, G that we use today. 
Um, the Hurrian hymn, which I started off with, that's the earliest form of notation so far discovered of a melody that can actually be reinterpreted. reinterpreted. That was um, inter the interpretation I was playing was by um, Professor Richard Dumbrill. And in short, um, you had the Hurrian text, which is basically a invocation to the goddess Nikal, the goddess of the orchards, to make a barren woman fruitful that she'd bear children. That was the that's the gist of the words of the song, which I'm not going to sing. Um, um, sorry, what was, <laughs> I've just lost the train of the question. What was the question again? I uh, just the the sources of information, the sources of oh yeah, uh, the melodies. Yeah, I was talking about the Hurrian hymn to Nikal. And um, yeah, below them, there's these intricate instructions talking about um, intervals between strings. And so it mentions about intervals and modes. And obviously, Professor Richard Dumbrell knows a lot about Near Eastern music. And he was able to decipher this. Um, and I've got um, a section on my website in the historical research section all about the intricate details of the Hurrian hymn with a talk, a video talk by Richard Dumbrell himself, which should make more sense. Because I'm, I'm not an archaeologist, I'm just a, a musician. But um, yeah, th th so that's the, his, the archaeological sources of melodies, that's notated melodies. But then you can also have um, traditions, for example, look at the um, Coptic, um, yeah, the Coptic church in Egypt. Some of the melodies there, according to the um, tradition of the Egyptian Orthodox Church, were adapted and adopted from pharaonic times. There's a pharaonic burial tune, apparently, that was um, called Golgotha. In fact, you can actually find this on YouTube. A really haunting melody, and apparently, according to their tradition, that was originally played for the burials of pharaohs. And they adapted the same melody to talk about the resurrection of Christ. Um, amazing stuff. But again, the frustrating thing with that is you can't um, verify that in the same way. I also mentioned, finally, um, to answer this question, the work of Susan Hake Van Chora, um, which is the most fascinating of all. Um, and I've got a section in my um, website called Music of the Bible Reveal. That was the title of her book. And she used the actual, um, she realised that the um, Masoretic text, the Teomem accents above the text, were actually transcriptions of chironomy gestures. Chironomy, again, is still practiced in the Coptic church. That uses hand gestures to denote changes in a melody. And she managed to work out, I don't know how she did it, um, the actual modes, the, in other words, the intervals of the, the melody indicated by um, the, the Teomem accents, by the actual um, rise and fall of the text, the, the emphasis of the actual Hebrew word. So it's, it's really in, intense, but just listen to her music, it's amazing. Um, and it's a shame that she, doesn't ha she didn't have more recognition of her work during her lifetime. And somewhat somewhat building off of, of those points, another question related to, I mean, I don't know if you would call it ethnomusicology, ethnomusicology but what is the relationship or the support provided by traditional music traditions, whether Jewish traditions, Arab traditional Middle Eastern Arab traditions, Coptic traditions that you just mentioned, in terms of the interpretation of both ancient, ancient instruments and melodies? Well, for example, look at the Hurrian hymn. Um, there's uh, Richard Dumbrell in his rather detailed talk when he tells how he deciphered the melody. He knew that if you have what you call it in musicology, you call a dyad, which means an indica indication of two notes, dyad mean, die meaning two. In traditional um, Middle Eastern music, that's right through to the present, that means instead of two notes, it means there's actually, the not two notes aren't played together, but it means means um, there's a, a passage of notes between the two notes. That's where he discovered, um, his, his version of the Hurrian hymn, his interpretation is much more musical because this tradition, which has survived from antiquity to the modern day, and he, he understood this. And um, yeah, so some elements of traditional music still survive, little shards of them. Just like folklore in our own um, our literary, the parallel in literature and folklore, the same is with music. There's all these little snippets and if you have academic ex experts who know all the details, you can pick out these wonderful threads. And like the Jewish modes, um, one thing about Jewish music, it's very, they very 
to tradition, no, no, thou shalt not change a note, thou shalt not change an accent. That's why the term in max accents were pres preserved, even when the original meaning was lost. So that probably goes for the same for the, the actual um, the modes used, the, 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 mo the intervals, and why these modes, as I was explaining through the performance, that they fit the instrument so perfectly. And um, one of the, the questions you raised the, the, uh, during the, the performance that somebody's asked is, can you please talk about the different techniques you were using to actually play the instruments, especially what your hands were doing as you were playing and how one hand was working vis-a-vis -vis the other and vis-a-vis -vis the yeah, instrument? There's a few threads there. Um, first of all, I looked at um, how the African lyre is still played today. That's throughout the African continent, particularly an instrument in Eritrea called the Kra. And you can find examples of that on YouTube. It's very popular. We've even done, got an electric version of it these days. And it's one, a technique called string blocking, uh, where you block specific strings with your left hand and you leave open only the strings you either desire to strum. Um, and it creates either strum drones like this, like an Appalachian dulcimer, or you can actually leave, you can actually have very basic harmonies like this. Or by moving fingers out the way, um, you can have a strum effect, like a rhythm effect and a melodic effect all at the same time. And tied in with this, um, there's this misconception that the ancients didn't use any form of harmony. Now this dates back, the whole myth begins, um, um, a, a confusion between the first um, what's the word? The first codification of harmony, in other words, how how to create harmony um, written down in, in rules. That was the Enchiriadis Treatise, that was the 9th century. And the first practice of harmony, which is as old as the human voice. When you think about it, every single human voice is a different pitch. In order for a group of humans, men and women, to sing together, you've got to fit notes which are harmonic. And you can find this all over Africa, for example, and in fact, all Aboriginal communities sing, use some form of harmony and they've never had any influence, any influence at all from the Western world. I'm looking at classical antiquity, look at the Orlos. This was a double reed pipe, two reeds played simultaneously at the same time with different holes on it, produced a spontaneous counterpoint. This is like 2000 years before Bach. A couple of other questions. Um... Any comment, this is, if, if you're a biblical scholar, perhaps, any comment on the instrument that Moses' sister used in the Song of Moses? Um, I wouldn't know, but more, I would imagine it's something similar to one of these things. What was the actual Hebrew word for it, you know? I, I, would, have to, I would have to go back and, and check. Uh, if it's something related to Kinor, Kinorot, or Nebel, or something, then it would be... A string instrument and the string instruments played in those days were 99% of the time it's going to be one of these things. And um, I guess that, that, that raises a, a related question is particularly, let's, let's just take, say, take ancient Israel, for example. Mm -hmm. Beyond the lyre, do we have a sort of set of instruments that would have been played in performances? Um, obviously, there was percussion, like the, um, if you look at Chronicle, I think it's the Book of Chronicles to talk, to describes the what the Levites were doing, those symbols and other things. They probably had instruments, sim wind instruments, probably similar to still played today um, throughout the Near East. What's that reed one called in Egypt? In fact, I think it's called the Zema, which is, um, that's the same Hebrew word for melody. But uh, yeah, there's a, a reed instrument that's played in Egypt. I think it's called the Zema. Um, flutes, of course, have been even predate, predate string instruments. There's even Neanderthal flute, so presumably some sort of wind instrument as well. Reed, wind, reed instruments, wind instruments, string instruments. There, there might have been some form of lute as well. Lutes were also common um, throughout the Near East. Uh, of course, that developed into the Ord, the Oud, I can't pronounce it, which is like a fretless form of lute. And then that ended up in, the, in Europe during the Crusades, uh, which developed into the Mon guitar. And its roots go way back to ancient Mesopotamia, the first lute, which actually dates back to more or less the first lyre. The instruments of the lute, incidentally, and the lyre are related in that in the lyre, just like on a lute, um, the strings pass over a bridge. And the very first lyres that was in, um, in Nikal, 
uh, not Nicole, um, Nippur, Nippur, in, in uh, Suma, in Suma. And these instruments were the, the instruments played there were the massive, the size of a harp, for example, um, the silver lyre of ore, which I actually happened to see in the British Museum. This was a harp sized lyre, but it was still a lyre because it had this bridge on it, and that predates the pyramids. Um, Back in those days, the lyre wasn't portable, but then the first portable lyre actually was seen in an Egyptian, uh, what was he called? Kunum Hotep. He was a um, Kunum Hotep, an Egyptian trader, I think. And it shows this depiction of these Canaanite traders, and that shows the first picture of a portable lyre. Very similar, more primitive version of something like this, held horizontally. And I think these Canaanite traders probably invented the first portable lyres because they were nomads and you can't luggle around a temple harp if you're a, no a musician and you're a nomad. Just a hunch. <laughs> and one, one uh, perhaps final question is, what do we know of the, the role of musical performances in, again, let's say, just take ancient Israel, for example. Is it, is it purely of a religious or cultic nature? Was, do, we, do we have examples of just music being f for entertainment or for other purposes but how do we see the function of music in sort of ancient israelite society you could say that about any society um, nothing has changed about our appreciation of music and having a good time um in the last two three thousand four thousand ten thousand years we have the same your set of neurons just like then they had music played at weddings joyous music um which survived in the form of klezmer music which is played throughout eastern europe um, Jewish traditional wedding music, that sort of thing was obviously going on back in ancient Israel. Obviously you have the sacred music, the music played uh, by the Levites in the temple, and music for occasions. If they had sporting occasions, presumably they had some music, as they did in ancient Greece. They had um, uh, music to recite epic poetry to. Um, for example, the Iliad and the Odyssey were almost certainly accompanied by music because the very particular meter of the text you can't possibly remember that meter without there be a tune to actually remember it to and things like that so nothing's changed the same sort of ceremonies the same and same sort of uses of music we have today rustic music folk music back in ancient greece the tortoiseshell lyre these things these are played in the symponiums ancient greek drinking parties the nice rough and ready instruments the guitar of their day whereas the kithara um, was the music favoured by the classical virtuoso musician, musicians of the day and they had kithara contests, um, demonstrations of pure virtuosity, just like we have modern um, classical competitions and, or, and um, uh, concertos to demonstrate the virtuosity of a soloist. Nothing's changed in our appreciation of music, just the cultural background's changed. Well, thank you very much, Michael. That was really a wonderful performance. And I think I know it, certainly I learned a lot and I, I think our audience learned a lot. Just it's really wonderful to have sort of ancient music, ancient musical practices sort of reproduced in such a way that we can still understand them, value them and hear them. And it's very exciting for you to both perform, but also describe what goes into making those reproductions. So, yeah, and I so say my, just to, to, to finish off, my whole purpose is to continue where the ancients left off. And that's the whole purpose of my website together, all my recordings on all the digital music platforms, etc. It's um, original music, new music for these recreated lives, but using the same ancient musical modes, scales and intonations. And just, um, I think what the modern world needs now to take our mind off all the chaos. Exactly. No, there's certainly a lot of that. And so I would point out that uh, Michelle did in the chat, the Zoom chat to everyone, she did share the link to Michael's website, basically ancientliar.com. And there you can go. I think you have YouTube clips of other performances and much more background information about the instruments and the history. Um, so we certainly encourage all of our attendees uh, to go to his website and check it out. But again, we really thank you for your time. I know Michael's based in the UK, so he's joining us a bit later in the day where he is. So we really appreciate uh, you coming to perform for us today. Thank you very much. The pleasure is mine. Thank you again.